And now I'd like to welcome to the stage Professor Cheryl Kickett Tucker. You might have seen her earlier. She came to um, stand with Auntie Liz Hayden. Professor Cheryl Kickett is a Wajak traditional owner and the founder of the Pindi Pindi Propriety Limited Center for Research Excellence in Aboriginal Wellbeing. Professor Cheryl's presentation will challenge us to think about what changes need to occur within mainstream organizations and the system to ensure Aboriginal security and well-being. She will share how her research is applied to grassroots programs and the importance of developing culturally secure engagement protocols within Aboriginal communities. Please welcome to the stage Dr. Ah, sorry, Professor Cheryl Kikataka. Kaya. Oh, that was pretty bad, guys. Kaya. Thank you. Wanju Nija Wajak Nuabuja. My name is Cheryl Kikitaka. I'm very pleased to be here. I'd like to um, say thank you to the Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people in the room here today. Your presence uh, is really appreciated. And if I say anything wrong, give me the nod and I'll try and correct myself. <laughs> um, we moved things around a bit this morning because Aunty Liz was obviously quite um, distressed and I think um, hearing that kind of raw uh, story affects all of us. So my duty was to look after my aunt, so that's what we did. So she's fine now, um, ready for the next year and the next week of work that she's got to lead into. Um, so thank you very much for your, um, your um, patience with us. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge um, Miss Jenny Brodie. Could she stand up, please? There she is. So Jen um, is the CEO of Swan Alliance out in the best place in Perth, Midland. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, Jen and I work quite closely uh, with local Aboriginal communities in the city of Swan, particularly in the Midland, Midvale, oh, city of Swan region. Uh, Jen is a patron um, on our Cart Court and Hoots basketball wellbeing program uh, and we're very lucky to have her and so when she asked if I could fill in for the wonderful Pat Dudgeon, I went, how can I, how can, like, Pat's amazing, like, you know, can't follow that, but she pulled my arm, so here I am today. Um, I, can we, is this thing on, are we starting? This isn't working. That's all right, IT people. Um, I'll just tell you a little bit about myself. I talk pretty fast, and I'm sorry if I do, because I've got so much to say in a half an hour. So, but you need to know who I am, so you know where I'm coming from. Um, you know, I respect the, uh, the story that Aunt Liz, you know, mentioned with us today, and what it shows us, even though you might seem like I've got it all together, trial and tribulation is right next to me. It's not far away, you know. Um, Oh, do I have to do it? No. Oh. It's to oh. That's all right. Um, so if I go over my time, someone better throw a bucket of water at me. So, okay. Um, <laughs> so I am a Noongar person. Um, I live, I still live in the area where I was born. Um, I went away for a year or so overseas, um, did some study in a, in a university. Um, and I've come back, I'm, I've married, I've been married for 25 years. We celebrate our silver wedding anniversary next year, but I've been with my hubby for 30 years, straight out of uni. You know, you see that fresh pair of eyes across the table at uni, and you go, oh, not bad, you know? And that's what happened. Anyway, three kids later, mind you, one in every decade, because my mother had eight children, and I'm in the middle of the eight, and I saw my mum struggle like no one, like just like Aunty Liz. And I don't want to be like that. So I had a kid at 20... I mean, my first son is 23. My next child is a girl and 18. And my little one is eight. <laughs> one in every decade. And, yeah, they're goods and bads of all that, but at least I had a life in between. You know, and I got qualified. I did my qualification well before I got married and had kids. So, um, But i tell you how that came about. That came about because, um, because of my tenacity playing basketball. Um, I'm an ex-National Basketball League player. I played in the US and I played here in Australia. And 
because of that backing, I know what I want and I go get it and nothing gets in my way, oh, except politics. <laughs> that wears me down. Um, but today um, I run a very successful basketball wellbeing program in the city of Swan at Swan Park. Uh, over 250 kids have come through our doors in two years. Like most of you, we get funded to look after 40, but not the rest. And most of those kids, uh, 60% are Aboriginal, and the other, um, say 35%, um, come from 15 different nationalities. So even though we're an Aboriginal corporation, and the target group are Aboriginal families and kids, we're an inclusive mob. We love kids. So we open our doors to the community, which is our community. And because someone is an Aboriginal, we don't say no. We say, yay, you're part of us and we're part of you. And our program is based on the principles of humanity. So, and like, the reason I'm so excited is because tomorrow's basketball. Yay. You know, 7.30, I'm up picking up. I've got a whole family of, um, there's 11 kids in this one family and I have six girls in my team. And I've got a land cruiser. The reason I've got a land cruiser is because I need to pick everybody up. So, and tomorrow at 7.30 up until 3, we're basketballing. And then the next day, one of my girls are in, like, the district teens, which is the next level. She's only 10 years old and she's the next best thing in Australian basketball. She's 10 years old. She's playing her second wobble game um, on Sunday and I'm taking all my girls to watch her at 9 o'clock on a Sunday morning. So she doesn't know. She doesn't know. So we're all going to be there in our uniforms cheering her on, you know. Anyway, look, I better move on. Okay. Oh, gosh, you're going too fast. So that first map, you would have seen that before. Has everyone seen? Okay. So you know we're not all the same though. We're all different. You know, um, my husband, like us Noongars are so related to each other. You gotta go somewhere else to find a partner. <laughs> I went to Yamaji country in Geraldton. I happened to be playing basketball up there. And that's where I first saw my hubby who comes from the Northeast Goldfields. He's a Noongar Awalian, Wangatha person. My kids have five different Aboriginal identities and they damn well know it too, because we teach them. So we're all different. Okay, I wanted to show you this one because this is home. This is my home. This is our home. This is all of our home. But you've probably never seen this map before. And you hear about the, um, the Wagal, uh, it created the river, the Durbal Yerrigan, the river. You can see how the river looks like a snake. You see from an aerial view. So Bilia is a Perth name. And it says, it says there, Wajat Nunga, Maya means home, showing the mighty Durbal Yerrigan. So that's home. So every time we get up and talk about, we talk about who we are, we talk about where we come from. This is home. But closer to home is the next one. So it says, Wanju, Wanju, Nija, Durbal Yerrigan, Wajat Nunga, Buja. That is um, closer to home for me, which is in the Guildford region, um, where um, my family really comes from, that Guildford space there. And that's a place called Devil's Elbow. <laughs> that's what we call it. You guys call it Fish Market Reserve. <laughs> yep. We call it Devil's Elbow. There's a beautiful um, stream of fresh water coming through there um, where people used to trap fish and whatnot. And it was the last known place of corroborees being held in the metropolitan area up on Success Hill. And if you go to Success Hill, which is the, sort of like the um, park next to this reserve, you'll see um, paintings and um, the, the, the Shire, the Bassanine Shire have put up um, posters and stuff. You can go and have a listen, look at the history and the, the painting. My mum's paintings are there, so you should go and have a look. Um, but today's presentation, next one, please, thank you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try um, to talk about today some of the challenges that we face um, and servicing our communities some, look, I don't know everything, you know. Just because you get a PhD doesn't mean you know everything. And I'm open to learning. I'm just going to give you some grassroots things that I know that have worked with the kids that I work with and the families. And then I'm going to look at, you know, what are the, some of the things that you can do in your organisations? But it really, it starts with you. Um, oh, that can we go back to that one? Sorry. See that picture at the end? That is my four, five, six year olds in our basketball wellbeing program. Yeah. They're called the ballers with a Z at the end. <laughs> it's always a Z at the end, you know. Um, the next one, uh, look, th these are um, uh, comments. When we know 
You know, our lives matter. Every person's life matters. But, you know, the governments of all the past decades have said, you know, we've got the most disadvantaged people are my people. And that's true. That is true. You know, um, and in the world we've been, you know, um, seen to be the most disadvantaged in the world. What, what a disadvantage means um, is social, financial, economic, um, education, housing, the whole raft of well-being. Um, if we move to the next one, thank you. Now, when we create community services, community programs, whatever you want to call it, community development. I, I don't like that word community development. I would like to see um, Aboriginal community thriving. We've gone past development and we're thriving. Um, but the issue for us is when we develop something new, we look at research, don't we? Well, we should. We should look at research. Um, but the problem is this. The research in Australia, with particularly with Aboriginal um, uh, triggers of well-being and the COAG and all those um, reports that come out is it always explores challenges and problems with a single lens. And that single lens causes tunnel vision. And let's go back to basketball, right? On a basketball court, if you're the point guard bringing the ball up, if you've got tunnel vision, you only see what's in front of you. You've got, got blinkers on. But what you need in basketball is peripheral vision because you need to see the nine players in front of you. You see what I mean? Research, unfortunately, it, the way that research is conducted in Australia for our people, it's a single lens creating a tunnel vision. Then we get that information or the government gets that information, state, local, federal, whoever. That narrow focus results in narrow findings. You know, And rather than being a colourful tapestry like this, the threads are one colour. Do you know what I mean? Okay. You know, it's a common practice. Whether they know they're doing it or not, but the governments continue to use this narrow focus and then what they do is they focus on what's not working and then try and fix it, which is deficit modelling. And we want a colourful tapestry with lots of ideas, not... Um, the deficit modelling. The kids that I work with, um, yes, I know they're, they've come from traumatic backgrounds. I, I know that. Um, but what we do with those... Can I do that? Yes. Oh, cool. Thank you. Yeah. So, what we do with our kids, we know they come, with our, come to us, to our basketball program, where we wrap a family around these kids. You have to come and see it. It's hard to explain. Uh, it's not just basketball, there's a lot more to it. Um, but rather than say, there's something wrong with you and you need fixing, we say, hmm, so what are your assets? And they go, what do you mean? What are you good at? You know, what are your strengths? And no one, honestly, has ever asked these kids these kinds of questions before, until we come along, you know? And we get them to take their lenses off, throw them in the bin. I can't see that, I need glasses for that. Oh, gosh. Jeez. Um, to t throw those glasses away and then put another set of glasses on to start looking at their strengths and their assets and what they bring to their life, to their family, to their basketball team and to the community. They haven't really thought about this before. So um, that's what we try to do. This is going to be fast. Oh, gosh. There you go. See that owl? His head's upside down. So we've got to do things differently, but it takes courage. Some people don't want to rock the boat. Some people want to have the status quo because, let's face it, us Aboriginal mob are an industry. We employ all of you. You know what I mean? Mm. So what's the solution? The solution is we have to have a holistic approach to gaining authentic, reliable, valid knowledge, holistic. We're talking about trauma informed here. You can't talk about trauma without talking about homelessness, without talking about racism, without talking about discrimination, without talking about unemployment, without talking about physical health, mental health. It goes on and on and on. It's, a, it's like throwing a pebble, the trauma informed pebble in the pond and the ripples. Every ripple is a part of our life. 
Nice picture of the girl, hey? Beautiful. So I'm going to jump around a little bit because I know Jen wanted me to talk about um, identity and self-esteem. That is my research expertise. I love doing this kind of work. I've developed five measures across the lifespan that look at identity and, and self-esteem um, for four-year-olds right up to adults and even non-Aboriginal adults who are carers, whether they're DCP carers, foster carers, adoptive parents or non-Aboriginal parents who married into our families, uh, looking at their perceptions of people and culture because how we transmit, what we say and what we do, we're transmitting to the children about their identity and self-esteem, you see. So we've, we've now got valid measures for the older children, which is um, 8 to 12-year-olds, the 13 to 17-year-olds, 17, 17 and the 18 plus, plus the non-Aboriginal parents' um, measures as well. We've just validated all this. Um, and they're um, the, the 8 to 12-year ones on the web somewhere. Um, but what it does, it, it, it doesn't measure, okay? It's not a diagnostic tool. It doesn't measure. What it does is explore what contributes to identity at these different stages because then you can work out, okay, if kids need to know about, for instance, um, young adults need to know more about the politics of life because they ask a lot of questions at that age. But they don't so much ask it at 8 to 12 years old age. The 8 to 12 year olds are more interested in learning language and culture and doing, you know, like dancing and painting. So if you know that about those kids at that age group, then your services should be targeting those kind of needs. So that's what this program, this is what this research does, okay? Um, in our world, though, when you look at that, that uh, model there, in the middle, at the centre of identity, is our country, family and culture. And I'm going to show you how everything's entwined. This is our world of relationships. And at the bottom, it starts off with family and self. Then it goes to our extended mob. Then we go into our kinship groups. And then we've got a language group. And then we've got our wider language group. And then we've got the wider Aboriginal community. And then we go to our ancestors. We've got a connection right through. So if you're working with a family or, you know, kids who are suffering pretty, pretty badly, you've got to navigate that, that whole system with them because they're tied physically, emotionally, spiritually to all of those relationships. So you can see how this is going to take time, you know. Unfortunately, I'm a researcher by trade. So when we go for research grants, we get the measly three-year research grants. So there's no time to develop rapport. There's no time to do dissemination properly because we don't get the funding. What they should do in Australia is have 10-year funding cycles like they do in Canada. So the government here talks about closing the gap and generational gaps. Well, chuck some generational dollars in those gaps. It's going to take a generation to make that happen. You know, it's going to give us time to navigate these worlds. The feelings associated with a kid's identity inside their Aboriginal circle looks like this. It's colourful. They're respected. They're accepted. They're centred. They're proud. They're valued. They're happy. They're supported. They're connected. They're strong. Now, let's have a look at our mob in the wider context. These are the people and institutions that we interact with, whether we want to or not. See how the matrix in the middle is really crazy? Because someone, an Aboriginal kid might have interaction with all of those organisations and groups and places and the relationships are all over the place, as you can see there. They've got to navigate that. They have to navigate, but they can't you know, because they don't have the navigation tools to walk between two worlds, let alone all these different relationships in between. So the feelings connected to their identity and self-esteem in relation to the interaction they have with institutions and systems looks like this. It's hollow. I'm judged. I'm misunderstood. I'm, I'm feeling unworthy. I'm undervalued. I'm sad. I'm angry. I'm on alert, I'm always on, I hear this a lot, I'm always on alert, ready for something to happen. I have severe re reservation about myself, 
who I am and about the people helping me. And I have resignation. Well, that's it. I'm going to chuck a rope over the thing and do something to myself. This is what happens. This is the reality. Um, I want to give you a quick example. Let's look at education, right? I love digging into ed education because I think the whole system is so old, dinosaurish. Any education ministers or <laughs> great? Have you got? Oh, Paulina! Oh, I know one person. She's awesome. This is not about you. This is about the system. <laughs> I love it. You guys have got to get to know Paulina. Paulina, stand up, please. Everyone's got to know you. Paulina Motloff, awesome lady. Okay, let's have a look at Aboriginal education, right? Um, our Aboriginal education. Look at the words there. What's the biggest word we've got there? Paulina. Relationships. Respected, strong, belonging, personal, respect, family, positive, ownership. Let's switch to the Wadula education system, shall we? Hmm. Time, work, learning, support system, programs, needs, teachers. Very different, aren't they? The first one's more about people. This is more about systems. But whose system? Not our system. Unfortunately, the, the, not the education, the system that we are in is a square system. And we are round people. So do you think the government and us could work out that we turn that square system and the round one, because we're always moving and dynamic. You fellas like your corners. You know, you put people in corners. Can we turn it into a 50 cent piece? So we're still moving and we've got a few little straight edges. Do you know what I mean? You'd think that'd be easy for government to work that piece out. Mm, not so. <laughs> but maybe you can in your daily work and your daily walk. Um, and I know the work you're doing is really hard. Don't get me wrong. I'm not here to criticise. I'm hoping to inspire you to look differently, you know? So I want you to do, look at this. I want you to look at your cultural security and integrity in your walk. This is about the footprints of the past and in particular those steeped in our ways of working is cultural security because our past does inform our present and ultimately our future. What does all this really mean academically? That's my words, but this is academically. You ready? <laughs> it's about making an experience secure, safe and comfortable for Aboriginal people to either access your services and engage in those services. But they, it needs an Aboriginal perspective, a world view, because really what we're all about is a social change on the individual, family, kinship, wider community levels. I'm going really fast. These terms you guys will be using, I'd say, cultural competency. It's a US-based term. Please don't use that. Otherwise, my Aboriginal colleagues will eat you alive, not me. Um, cultural awareness. I hear that word. Oh, we've just done a cultural awareness training workshop. I said, really? Now you're culturally aware? What the heck are you going to do about it? And who's going to make sure that you're going to stay culturally aware? Do you know what I mean? Cultural training. Yeah, okay. And the ones I really like is, I used to go to school with Aboriginal people. My friend's Aboriginal, so, you know, I'm... I know. I'm like, yeah, right. <laughs> In my world, this is my framework for cultural security. There are four R's of cultural security. Respect, relationship, responsibility and reciprocity. Um, because I'm running out of time, I'm going to zip through, but these are the key... The key thing, the biggest one for me is that reciprocity. So if you ask someone to do something in our community, like it's a give and take, like, um, like Jen, for instance, she's asked me to come here today, but Jen knows I'm going to want something from her. Jen. <laughs> but for the community, not for me. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, it's all basketball. Um, let's zip over this, because you can read um, more on Julie Kaufman. She's the expert on this, okay? Uh, she's my colleague from Notre Dame University. And I'm going to use her, her chart next, because I want you to look at this one better, okay? So she developed this cultural security continuum. 
And where do you fit, or where does your organisation, or your, you, you've got to look at yourself first, your service and your organisation, where do you fit on this continuum? Are you aware? And if you're aware, you've got to brokerage how you're going to make the environment or the service safe, so the safety comes into it. Then you must put protocols in place, policies, that, deter that ensures there's a cultural security in your workplace. Because you need to be audited, you need to be open to those policies being culturally, having a cultural security audit to see if your people, place and policies are culturally secure. So people might do the awareness training, but they don't actually have any rules or regulations in between, do you know what I mean? And they don't have a system to say, okay, every six months we're gonna do an audit. So they don't even do that either. It's kind of like the wraps. Reconciliation action plans, it's a piece of paper, but no one does anything with them. Looks good on paper, but nobody does anything with them. I haven't seen anything yet, but. And then what we ultimately want is cultural sustainability. So it's like breathing air, it always it automatically happens. It's autonomous. We want us, all of this, us in the room, to get to that end of the cultural sustainability. Like I said, Julie Coffin's the expert. You need to read her stuff. But how we get to this, you guys, we've got a lot of work to do because we've got to do this. We've got to decolonise ourselves. Because decolonisation is about the severe imposition of Western knowledges, Western beliefs, Western values upon our people. And it's, it's be, you can see the evidence now, like with the kids, you know, destroying themselves. How do you decolonise in your walk of the work that you're doing and in your personal life? Well, you can do it every day. You know, um, you can replace English words with the local dialect. So the local dialect, he's Wajak. There's not too many Wajak speakers left. Most of the speakers we have speak Baladong, like my auntie. So, you know, you can, for instance, you can change your meeting room. Instead of the, the Swan meeting room, call it the Mali meeting room. Do you know what I mean? It's simple. And another example is I went to a primary school that has 65% population of a diverse group of primary school kids. They had every language in welcome except ours. And I'm like, are you kidding me? There is one school, and I'll mention it, Southwell, Southwell Primary School, amazing school down in the south. Every building is bilingual. So English and then a Noongar word right alongside it. It's like as soon as you walk in, it's one of the best schools I've ever been to. The other is Hilton Primary School. And the other one is Mulich Noongar Community College in Midvale. So if you want examples of even just placing words and, and stories on buildings, that's a way to start, you know. Um, you know, the welcomes to countries and things, that's another way to start. But the biggest thing is privileging our knowledges. And you can't do that if we're not at that table. Some of the things that you could do um, is for cultural security in your services and programs, you must reach out to all members of our community. In our community, there are people that do a lot of talking. They're not necessarily the people that you need to speak to. Do you know, do you know what I mean? There are community people who do not access any services at all. They are really quiet. Um, they are either quite, um, you know, extremely vulnerable or they just don't know how to mingle in, you know, how to, how to communicate with the wider society. So they, they hide away in their ha houses and you don't know that they're there. Um, but you have to reach out to those communities. There's a way to do that, right? Some people are good at it and some aren't. Um, we need to recognise and focus on the Aboriginal uh, uh, world view of living, passing, and the afterlife. As my auntie said, a lot of our mob, um, particularly Noongar people, are Christians. And if you go up north, you'll, you'll come across a lot of Catholic people. So that spiritual... Is that five minutes? Oh, cool. Um, that, 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 um, that's important. You need to understand that because that's part of who we are, about all those relationships at the start with the ancestors that I spoke about. We need to recognise and use Aboriginal governments. The per what I mean by that is the person that does the most speaking in a room is not necessarily the leader. It's usually the quiet person. You've got to know that. You have to know who those people are. That takes time. You have to have this multifocal lens to explore and capture the interaction of all the domains that make up our wellbeing. You can't focus on one. I know that's hard in government because government have KPIs and those KPIs are siloed and they say you've got to fix this, fix this, fix this, but you can't do that without doing A, B, C and D as well. 
So we have to change and challenge the way that we, um, you know, get our funding and uh, register, um, I guess, achievement across those KPIs and have... You, you yourself should be challenging those KPIs. Do, do you know what I mean? Um, we need to have more of a strength-based approach, not your, you know, that I know you're hurting and you're, you need healing, um, but with, there's things we can learn about people in that space, you know, um, that they have assets and they are strong. What, make, what makes those families and kids strong? Instead of what's wrong, you know, build on the strengths and, and the assets and the positivity of those families. Um, we need to utilise and um, explore what is working and what is not. Um, Aboriginal members of our community have to be at any table and it has to happen during the development, the inception, the production, the servicing, the evaluation and the reporting. Um, I've just finished a project in Kalgoorlie um, after the death of uh, young Elijah. Um, I was asked by the Prime Minister's office to work up there with the Aboriginal kids and we've Design, co designed an instrument called Guthu. Guthu in Wangatha language means we are one. Um, and um, we're now doing the reporting on that. And my kinship champions, who I employed in the project, are coming with us on some conferences. Um, and they're going to be doing, I mean, they've never done it before and they're frightened. But this is part of their learning as well, you know what I mean? And people to learn from them is to get up and do conferences and speaking. Um, on Tuesday, I had my young peer ambassadors young girls from my basketball program, and we had a session with June Oscar, the Social Justice Commissioner for the Human Rights Commission, and they did a presentation in front of her about being a young Aboriginal girl, what the challenges are, what they want for their life, and how things can move forward. Um, they are quite shy, and they said, we won't get up unless you're with us. And I said, well, I'm not saying nothing. So I stood beside them, but I didn't say a thing. You know, like, that's, that's the kind of um, thing we have to do with our kids, because they can do it. They just get shy. Um, the last one is reciprocity. It means you have to be giving, and, but you also must receive. You know, if we want to give something to you, you must take it. The thing is, though, the person who risks nothing does nothing. So will you, won't you? Will you conduct your own self-audit? Uh, what are you willing to do? Do you have, the first thing for us, compassion and empathy, care, love and above all integrity. And I say this, again, I go back to education because I work in a lot in schools. I see a lot of teachers who really don't give a rat's about our kids. And I wish I could do a personality test on them. And if they don't like kids, they shouldn't be teaching. <laughs> Full stop. And if they don't like our kids, they shouldn't be touching, you know, being with our kids. I employ a lot of basketball coaches. And the first thing I say is, do you love kids? And they tell me how much they love kids. And then I ask, do you love basketball? You know, do you love our, our families? And when I get the yes, 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 then I employ them. If I get a no, they need to go and find another career because that's not the right career. You know, you wouldn't want a brain surgeon who's really interested in, um, I don't know, growing potatoes. Really, that's where his heart lies, but he's here messing around with your potato in your head. <laughs> you know, you wouldn't want that. So it's the same with our people. They've got to have the heart and soul, you know. And that's the words at the start of my presentation was... Um, Court and Kurumich, which means your heart and soul. So I'm going back to that. You know, how will you move forward in your journey to decolonisation? I mean, do you have the skills and knowledge and confidence to negotiate your way in, out and around our community? And how are you going to translate the um, presentations today, particularly this one, so that our community recognise and, and you act upon what you need to act upon? And what changes are needed in the government system? And the thing is, you heard my auntie today, the sacrifices she makes for our people and to be here with you today. Are you willing to make those personal sacrifices as well? Because we're watching you. We are watching you. And let's go to the next one. So is your court, your head, your heart and could admit your soul ready to show, give and receive? In order to work with our people, you must have these skills. You must be able to deep listen. Can you sit still for five minutes and block everything out with your eyes closed? I've done this with academics and it doesn't work. They can't do it. I don't know about you guys. We, can't, we haven't got time so we can't do it now. Do you know, can you give and receive respect? Can you give and receive understanding? Can you give and receive empathy, integrity, sincerity, um, being valued and giving value to someone else? Our world is unpredictable. 
We don't have a nine to five. We don't clock in and clock out. Life keeps running for us. Your actions speak more louder than your words in our community. You must release control. And lastly, if you do all of this, you'd be all unemployed and looking for new careers. <laughs> you see, that's the personal sacrifice. Are you willing to or not? Because we're watching you. Human progress is neither automatic nor inevitable. Every step toward the goal of justice requires sacrifice, suffering and struggle. The tireless exertions and passionate concern of dedicated individuals. So Martin Luther King said that and I love that and I love the appearing eye because we do watch and we watch your actions more than your words. Okay, I think that's me. So Burrida means catch you next time. <laughs> Thank you.